Okay, last time we left off talking about sleep and sleep stages. This is showing you typical EEG and eye movement patterns for these different sleep stages. As you're relaxed but awake before you get to sleep, you have um, sort of larger, faster EEG. This is supposed to represent alpha activity at about 10 hertz. This is a really common frequency of brain activity. It's the dominant frequency that you see in EEG when someone is awake. And in stage one sleep, you can see that the EEG becomes much smaller in amplitude, uh, but you still have these very high frequency but irregular um, waves happening here. In stage two sleep, you start seeing sleep spindles. These are bursts of a half a second or more of 12 to 14 hertz waves. And then also you start seeing K-complexes, these fast negative deflections. Negative is plotted up with EEG and slower positive deflections that occur. Stages three and four sleep are together known as slow wave sleep, and some authorities just combine them into a single stage. The only difference between stage three and four is the amount of time that the brain is producing these very large, very slow waves called delta waves. If it's more than half the time, then you're in stage four, less than half, you're in stage three. And then finally, there's REM sleep, or paradoxical sleep. You can see that the brain has, again, these smaller, faster voltage changes, kind of like stage one sleep. The brain is actually more active during REM sleep than it is during stage three and four. The brain is least active during stage four sleep, despite having the very large amplitude EEG. The brain is very inactive, but the activity that's there tends to be much more highly synchronized neurons in big chunks of the cortex having depolarizations synchronously. REM sleep is characterized by more desynchronization across the cortex, much more similar to what you would see in an awake brain or a very lightly sleeping brain. But this is what really sets it apart, the eye movements. So you can see that these eye movements can be very large and frequent during REM sleep, which is short for rapid eye movement. So again, REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep, these are periods characterized by rapid eye movements. It's also known as paradoxical sleep. This is usually how it's referred to in animals, because it's deep sleep in some ways, but light sleep in others. The EEG waves are irregular, low voltage, and fast, like a light sleep. But on the other hand, the postural muscles of the body are much more relaxed than at other stages, more like a deep sleep. Stages one through four together are referred to as non-REM sleep, or NREM. We progress in order through stages one, two, three, and four, and then after about an hour, we start moving backward through the stages from four to three to two, but instead of going back into stage one sleep, we typically go into REM sleep. This pattern, one through four and back to REM, repeats over and over again throughout the night. The whole process takes about 90 minutes. This is known as the sleep cycle. Early on in the night, we spend more time in stages three and four sleep. In other words, stages three and four tend to be longer early on in the night. The length of these stages, three and four, decrease as the night progresses. We still continue to progress through all the stages every 90 minutes. It's just that the duration of the stages tends to decrease. And in fact, towards the end of the night, we may be spending little to no time in stage three and four sleep. Instead, REM sleep predominates later in the night. So as we start spending less and less time in stages three and four, the duration of the REM cycles tends to increase. REM sleep is strongly associated with dreaming. Something like 90% of the time, if you wake somebody up during REM sleep, they'll report a dream. But people do report dreaming during other stages as well. Although typically the dreams that they report during those stages tend to have less vivid visual content and tend to have less of a narrative content, less of a storyline. This is showing you a typical night's sleep for a young adult. So we start off awake and then move into stage one, then into stage two, three, four, and then go back into stage three, two. But instead of re-entering stage one, we enter REM sleep, indicated by the red line here. Then it's back through 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, REM, 2, 3, 2, REM, 2, REM, 2, REM. 
So you'll notice the overall pattern here. Early on in the night, spending a lot of time in stages three and four in slow wave sleep. Later on in the night, spending more time in REM sleep. So the duration of the REM cycles increases, the duration of the slow wave sleep decreases until it often goes away completely. This is sort of a, a schematic showing you a typical night's sleep for a young adult. But it never really looks quite like this. This is more like the ideal. Generally, there are going to be disruptions and quirks that happen. This is showing you three actual nights sleep for three individuals. You can see they start off awake. Stage one isn't shown, but they go through stage one, two, three, and then four. And then three, two, REM. Two, three, four, three, two, but here they don't go into REM at all. They just skip right to three and four. And then skip three, go into two, and then REM. Two, three, two, REM. Two, REM. Two, and then they wake up. So again, the general trend is intact. You're having roughly 90 minute cycles. You can see that there's about 90 minutes between the middle of each REM period. And you're tending to go through at least most of the stages in order. And the subject is spending more time in slow wave sleep early in the night. You can see a lot of threes and fours here, very little toward the end. And spending more time in REM sleep as the night progresses. Same with this one here. So awake, two, three, four, skip three here, two, three, four, three, two, three, two, REM. Here they've gone quite a while without any REM sleep. Again, it doesn't always fit the model. And then two, three, two, REM, and awake. The red line here indicates postural movements, shifts of the body, rolling over, for example. And you can see that that tends to happen more during light stages of sleep, like stage two here, here. During REM sleep, there are changes in the activity of the brain. This is measured using PET, positron emission tomography. That's a bit easier for an experiment studying sleep because it's virtually silent, unlike functional MRI, which is very loud. Uh, but it does involve injecting radioactive oxygen. During REM sleep, you see increased activity in parts of the pods. This part of the brain actually triggers the onset of REM sleep. You see increased activity in parts of the limbic system, which we'll see later is important for certain emotional states. More activity in parts of the parietal lobe and parts of the temporal lobe. You'll remember that the posterior areas of the parietal lobe and the ventral part of the temporal lobe are important for visual processing. And they're also important for visual imagery. This increased activity may reflect the imagery associated with dreaming. There's decreased activity in other parts of the brain. For example, in primary visual cortex, so this is that first part of the brain that gets input from the eyes, its activity is suppressed. So external input for touch, hearing, sight, and so forth tends to decrease in the brain during REM sleep, effectively shutting out most of the sensory information from the outside world. Some of it does get in, though, as evidenced by the fact that you've probably incorporated alarms and things like that, or other people speaking to you into your dreams. There's also decreased activity in the motor cortex, so there's less movement output during REM sleep. And also there's decreased activity in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We'll talk more about this a little bit later and what it might mean. REM sleep is also associated with a distinctive pattern of high amplitude electrical potentials known as PGO waves. These have been recorded primarily in animals, but there's some evidence that they exist in humans as well. These are waves of neural activity, first detected in the pons, then in the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and then the occipital cortex, hence the name PGO waves. Interestingly, if we deprive experimental animals of REM sleep, they end up having a higher density, in other words, more frequent PGO waves, when they're allowed to sleep normally. It's as if the brain kind of needs these PGO waves or recognizes that there's been too little of something important and tries to compensate for having had too few of them. But we still don't really know what these do. This figure is showing the typical locations where these panto geniculo occipital waves are recorded. So here's a location in the uh, dorsal part of the pons, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and in the occipital lobe. 
We'll talk about these PGO waves again when we get to dreams. In addition to triggering the onset of REM sleep and initiating these PGO waves, cells in the pons send messages to the spinal cord which actively inhibit motor neurons, mainly the ones that control the body's large postural muscles. And as a result, you're effectively paralyzed during REM sleep. There's very little motor movement that happens in the large muscles of the body during REM sleep. Except in individuals with REM behavior disorder. This disorder is associated with vigorous movement during REM sleep. It's still poorly understood, but it seems to be usually associated with acting out dreams, sometimes violently and very vigorously. This occurs mostly in older folks, particularly older men, and often in people with neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's uh, often lose neurons in certain parts of the brain, including in the pons. So it may be that this is associated with damage to the pons, particularly the neurons in the pons that inhibit the spinal neurons that control large postural movements. Interestingly, you can destroy these neurons in animals and you'll find similar effects where cats, for example, will sort of get up and stumble around while they're dreaming. This is different than sleepwalking or somnambulism. That typically does not occur during REM sleep. Instead, that often occurs during stage two sleep, during the lighter stages of sleep. It's also poorly understood, but it's easier to understand if you imagine that the suppression of brain activity during sleep is not a uniform thing across the whole brain, but can occur in different parts of the brain in differing amounts. We'll revisit that idea again later, again when we talk about dreams. So why do we sleep? What's the whole point? Originally, the function of sleep was probably simply to conserve energy, and we find that even single-celled organisms will change their metabolic demands over the course of the day as metabolic resources, in other words, food, becomes less available to them. In mammals, body temperature can decrease by about 1 to 2 degrees Celsius. It doesn't sound like much, but we actually spend a lot of energy just maintaining our body temperature. So reducing that body temperature a couple of degrees can save quite a bit of energy. And of course, we're just laying there most of the time, so there's a dramatic decrease in the activity of the muscles. Again, reducing energy demand quite a bit. This is an interesting figure showing the number of hours each day that certain animals sleep. First, let's take a look at animals that sleep a lot. So bats hang out on the roofs of caves and they sleep something like 20 hours a day. There are only a few hours during the day when their main food source is available to them, the bugs that come out in the late evenings. And that's when bats are most active. They go out and they eat as much as they can and then spend the rest of the time kind of relaxing and conserving energy. Armadillos similarly only come out about once a day to feed. And of course, we all know that cats are exceedingly lazy. <laughs> uh, but you'll notice that cats and bats are predators. And when and where they sleep means that there's not a lot of animals that might come and eat them. There's not much of a reason to stay awake. And then there are animals that sleep very little and are easily aroused even when they are sleeping. So you can see cows, for example, only sleep 3.9 hours in the night. Horses, about 3 hours or so. So what's different with these animals? A couple of things. First, they tend to eat a lot. They have to keep eating. The grasses and other vegetation that these animals eat tend to not be terribly nutritious. Uh, they really have to eat a lot in order to extract enough energy to maintain their large bodies. So they're pretty much eating whenever they're awake and they stay awake quite a bit so that they can eat more. That's one reason. Another reason, though, is that these are prey animals, and they tend to sleep in places and in ways that make them vulnerable to attack. So they sleep relatively little to minimize the chances of attack, and as I mentioned, even when they're asleep, they tend to be easily aroused. Interestingly, though, just like humans, they also have suppressed muscle activity during REM sleep. So during REM sleep, even these animals will lay down. And this puts them at even greater risk, of course, but that just tells you how important REM sleep is. Again, we still don't really know what it's important for exactly, 
but clearly it has a very important function, and pretty much all animals that sleep do have REM sleep. We also know that sleep enables restoration to occur in the brain. There's a lot of protein synthesis that happens when you're asleep. This is a really important time for protein synthesis throughout the body, but your neurons especially tend to use this time to rebuild proteins that have been broken down. Energy supplies are replenished in the cells. And more recently, it's been shown that sleep is really important for removing waste and toxins from the brain. The fluid that drains this waste from the brain moves barely at all during the day, but moves pretty rapidly at night when you're asleep. Also, individual neurons and glial cells remove wastes more efficiently when you're sleeping than when you're awake. In some studies showing that this waste removal is about 10 times more effective at night when you're sleeping than it is during the day when you're awake. These toxins include beta amyloid proteins, which we know are important for Alzheimer's disease. So what happens when you deprive people or animals of sleep? Moderate sleep deprivation of, of a couple of nights results in impaired concentration, irritability, hallucinations, tremors, unpleasant mood, and decreased responses of the immune system. Prolonged sleep deprivation is something that we can only do in laboratory animals, although it sometimes happens in humans as a result of damage to parts of the brain, and the results are pretty similar. This results in increased metabolic rate, increased appetite, and elevated body temperature. Ultimately, it results in immune system failure and decreases in brain activity. Generally speaking, prolonged sleep deprivation results in death as a result of the immune system failure. The subject will generally succumb to a fatal infection. I mentioned earlier that sleep is really an important time for protein synthesis, and your immune system relies heavily on the creation of new cells and new proteins in order to function correctly. When you don't get enough sleep, that protein synthesis can't happen as well as it needs to in order to defend your body from disease. Sleep also plays an important role in enhancing learning and strengthening memory. For example, performance on a newly learned task is often better the next day if you get adequate sleep the night that you learn the task. Interestingly, functional brain imaging studies show increased brain activity in the parts of the brain that were activated by the newly learned task while you're asleep. In other words, if you are practicing a particular task during the day which activated specific networks within the brain, when you're sleeping, those same brain areas tend to become reactivated. It's as if the brain is sort of rehearsing what it is that you've learned during the day. Further research has shown that the degree of that activity during the night correlates with improvements in performance seen the next day. In other words, it looks as though the more your brain is rehearsing the activity in the night, the better your performance the following day. How about REM deprivation specifically? So in these studies, they'll measure EEG and eye movements while people are asleep in order to assess which stage of sleep they're in. And then they'll systematically wake them up anytime they start entering REM sleep. These are not fun studies to participate in. In these studies, they find that when people are deprived of REM, the body tends to increase its attempts at going into REM sleep throughout the night. It's as if the brain recognizes the, the lack of REM and tries to compensate for it. And when you finally let people sleep normally, they spend more time in REM sleep when they're allowed to sleep normally. In one study, subjects that were deprived of REM sleep for four to seven nights increased the time spent in REM by 50% when they were no longer REM deprived. So what are dreams really? The answer is we don't really know what they are or what purpose they serve. Uh, there have been lots of theories over the ages, of course. In ancient times, they were thought to be the result of being visited by spirits or perhaps predictions of the future. Freud had a different idea. He thought that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. He thought that they were manifestations of unconscious desires and wishes that had been transformed into different types of imagery and experiences. Probably the most uh, widely accepted contemporary theory of dreams 
is the activation synthesis hypothesis or some of its more contemporary descendants. The basic idea behind this is that dreams start with spontaneous activity in the pods, possibly the PGO waves, which then activate the occipital lobe and other parts of cortex. The idea is that the spontaneous activity is more or less random. So you've sort of got random signals coming up from below, stimulating different parts of cortex. And the cortex does more or less what it normally does when you're awake. It tries to make sense of this input. It synthesizes a story, a narrative, an explanation for the pattern of activation that it's experiencing. Normal sensory information from your other senses can't compete with this self-generated internal spontaneous stimulation, and what results are essentially hallucinations. Here's kind of a cartoony view of this idea. So again, parts of the ponds are generating patterns of activity that then get relayed to various parts of cortex and generate more or less random patterns of activity there. This works something like a Rorschach test or a projective test where the ongoing pattern of activity in the brain and the existing state of the brain, including your memories and your typical ways of experiencing the world and interpreting things, shape how that random information is interpreted. For example, random activation of the cells and visual cortex that detect vertical lines might be interpreted as, uh, as trees as you're running through the woods. On the other hand, if you had just watched a, a documentary on Alcatraz right before you went to bed, you might interpret those vertical lines as bars. That then triggers other association, and then subsequent spontaneous activity will be more likely to be interpreted in line with the ongoing narrative created by previous interpretations. It may be that input from the pons activates the amygdala and other parts of the limbic system, which we'll see later are important for emotion, and may impart the dream with emotional content. Because a lot of the prefrontal cortex is inactive during PGO waves and during REM in general, memory of dreams is weak. We know that particularly dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which I mentioned earlier, is important for encoding new memories, for creating new memories. It's also important for what's called working memory. We'll talk more about working memory later, but you can think of it as sort of your mind's RAM, random access memory. It constitutes your ability to maintain information online, to keep track of what's happening, and incorporate new experiences and new information with what came right before. So if this part of the brain is suppressed, which it is during dreaming, then the sudden scene changes that occur in dreams are more easily explained. It's easy to lose track of what's happening and start interpreting new patterns of activity as part of a new narrative. So when Darth Vader shows up in the campground, it doesn't seem as strange as it might in real life. There's also a lot of speculation and even some scant evidence that lucid dreaming may involve an increase in activation of prefrontal cortex. Some of you will have heard of lucid dreaming. This happens to most people occasionally, and it happens to some people a lot, where you're dreaming, but you know that you're dreaming, and often you can exert some voluntary control over what's happening in the dreams. You can choose what happens next, oftentimes. It may be that that state of lucid dreaming is associated with a relative increase in activity in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain that's important for logic and reason and keeping track of what's going on. And as a result, you can recognize you're in a dream and then take steps to exert influence on that dream. During REM sleep, activity is also high in areas outside of V1, visual cortex outside of V1. These are parts of the brain that are important for visual processing when your eyes are open, but they're also important for visual imagery when you're awake. It may be that activity in these areas accounts for the visual imagery, the visual content that's so important for your dreams.